Warning, for younger viewers, the flyback transformer on CRT TVs can cause some distress to your ears with very high frequencies. And for that, I do not apologize. This is the Winter Argos catalogue from 1998. For those outside the UK, Argos is a shop which sells, well, pretty much everything. But it's all kept out of sight behind the counter. Instead of browsing real products, everyone simply enters a room with catalogues spread out. Everyone knows what they're there for and making eye contact with fellow browsers is not recommended. You then order by browsing the catalogue, writing the product number down and handing a slip to an employee who proceeds to bring out your item as if by magic. However, there is no chance in hell they would have ever been able to bring out this absolute mammoth of a television. This is the Toshiba 3787DB. It's a 37 inch CRT released in 1998 and it's the largest 4x3 aspect ratio TV ever released in the United Kingdom for consumer use. And by that I mean CRT, cathode ray tube. The largest CRT Argos could muster in 1998 was this huge 34 inch Bush model priced at £799 and good lord, that would have been hard enough to move. Most families would have owned something like this, a 21 inch model. If you were lucky, it might even have had teletext. You could get bigger rear projection units, but they don't even come close to a CRT screen, especially when you try to watch one from a side angle. But this was a critical point for televisions. This was the time when widescreen models were starting to land, with the richest families snapping them up for that home cinema experience. Philips Digital Widescreen. Now you can see what you've been missing. Okay, but this, this thing is obscene. Whereas you could probably lift a modern 37 inch LCD TV on your own without difficulty, this took three people to get it in here. It's like picking up a small car. It's almost like a last hurrah from Toshiba for the 4x3 aspect ratio, and that's exactly why we need to take a look at it. £1,999. That was the price this chonker was sold at in 1998. That equates to £3,693.23 today, or $4,674 American dollars. It quickly accumulated a number of critic awards, including the Home Entertainment Awards 1998 Best TV Winner, a Watt TV and Video Award, and the Best Buy Home Cinema Choice. You might think with widescreen coming in, it would be silly to buy a 4x3 screen at this point, but 4x3 would remain the norm well into the noughties. Plus, widescreens at the time just looked tiny in comparison. As you can see, this thing more or less has a 37 inch viewable screen size. It's a bit less than 37 inch, but you know, that's fine. The rest is behind the plastic. If you sat on your lounge floor playing PlayStation with this, you'd definitely get square eyes. It's huge, and although you could get slightly larger TVs in America, like this 40-inch Mitsubishi Beast, demonstrated by the channel Retro Tech USA, which for commercial use actually went up to a Sony rivaling 43-inch, this was the largest consumer direct tube 4x3 our little island could muster. The TV alone measures 1 meter wide, 78 centimeters tall, and 65 centimeters deep, and weighs over 80 kilograms. Under normal load, it sucks 218 watts of power, and it consists of all these components. Yeah, there's quite a lot. Honestly, it shocks me that anything works when I look at lists like this, let alone that they still work decades on. Now, being from 1998, this thing has an analog TV tuner. That's not much use nowadays, and it would be a crying shame to connect the games console up to this thing with an RF lead. But thankfully, we are treated to a number of other connections. But before we connect anything up, let's address the elephant in the room, the TV stand. Now this stand comes with the telly as standard, mainly because it would likely turn your average TV stand into absolute dust. It's actually quite a cool stand too. You can open it fully up and then you've got three shelves to put your Skybox on, VCR, and of course Philips CDI, along with two side compartments for VHS tapes or whatever you want as long as they're not an oversized case anyway.
from the back we can then access all the wiring we need to, although if you had this thing shoved in a corner then this would be an absolute nightmare. Anyway, whilst we're here let's go through the main connections. So on the left here we've got four speaker outs for the surround speakers that the TV shipped with brand new. Then we've got a whopping three bi-directional SCART connections which allows input and output of RGB, composite and S-video. Although the third SCART connection also has parallel S-video with audio inputs which are also shared with the front connections. I'll get to those in a bit. We've also got phono audio outputs here, digital audio input over there and of course our RF connection for plugging in an aerial or anything else you like. It's pretty well featured as you might expect. So it's easy enough to connect our CDI up using a SCART cable and then we can get a look at what this can do. But before that, I just wanted to tell you that I will be at the Doncaster Dome on the 29th and 30th of March for their Game On exhibition. What is Game On? Well, it's an in-depth look at the evolution of video games over the past 50 years. It's definitely up my street and I'm pretty certain it's up yours too. Honestly, there's so much to see and do here from the latest interactive experiences to 150 playable arcade, console and handheld games. Plus, it's suitable for all ages. I will be there on the Friday evening and Saturday morning sessions, which you can specifically book for using your Game On featuring Nostalgia Nerd ticket at checkout. I've popped the link in the video description so that you can take a look yourselves. I definitely hope to see you there. You do not want to miss this. Now, let me tell you, turning this thing on is a harrowing experience. The absolute clunk you hear followed by a whoosh of static is pretty unnerving. If the tube on this thing imploded, you would certainly know about it. But the quality is evident straight away. Just look at how clear everything is. The screen is so big you can of course see visible scan lines and there's very little distortion even at the edges which is very impressive for a tube of this size. This thing is packed with the latest tech that Toshiba had to offer. That includes an FST tube making the screen flatter than normal, although with a screen this size you can very much still see the curvature. Just don't tell flat earthers. The shadow mask features Invar technology, a special nickel alloy that resists thermal expansion, allowing the tube to operate at higher voltages and display more vivid whites. Toshiba's Super Scene Control improves picture contrast along with a dark glass tint, apparently providing up to 18% more contrast than a standard Toshiba TV. It certainly does look good, but then there's also a plethora of controls to play with, for which you'll need this hefty remote, including a secret slidable section for those lesser used buttons. Nice. Honestly, about half of the manual is dedicated to this lump hammer of a wand it tells you how to change the surround sound, what effects you want, how to set a timer, noise reduction, have this blue screen kick in instead of background radiation, how to change inputs, how to use teletext, how to change the teletext font, how to use NICAM dual language broadcasts, how to change the picture brightness, colour, tint, sharpness, etc, etc. There's enough here to keep any dad happy for days. It even tells you how to prepare the remote control. If you hold down the mute button on the control and press the menu button on the TV, you can actually enter the service mode menus which allow you to check the screen geometry, run a self-diagnosis and anything else a Toshiba engineer might like. There are various screens for assessing and adjusting the image. I imagine this hasn't been calibrated for about 20 years but actually it's not bad. Anyway, let's get back to business. Let's plug a Super Nintendo into this thing. Now for that we'll need to reveal the front connectors which include headphone out, an S-video in, along with composite and audio connections. The Super Nintendo can do S-video so let's see how that looks. One really cool feature here is that you can route these wires out of the bottom and still close the front door again so it looks tidy. Neat. Literally. 
Whatever game you play, it looks fantastic, honestly. It's no wonder that this TV is highly sought after among retro gamers, who have the space for it at least. This video might not be up to RGB levels of clarity, but it still looks pretty damn nice here. Now obviously this is running the PAL picture format, so we've got borders at the top and the bottom. Things would look a bit more impressive with an NTSC console, which actually this TV can handle at 60Hz, which is very unusual for a 90s CRT in this region. But it doesn't matter because now we are talking. This is the game we truly need to see to see this set in action. Rise of the Fricking Robots. Just look at that. Such stunning visuals, only compounded by the sheer vibrancy of the Toshiba 3787DB. Absolutely incredible scenes. Tell you what, let's hook up a Mega Drive with its true RGB and see how that looks. Holy moly! This is where it's at. My god. No, but seriously, the Mega Drive looks incredible on this screen, even when you squish it into a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. It still looks good, but it not only looks great, it also sounds great. This thing has two 15 watt side speakers, a 15 watt center speaker, and a built in 25 watt subwoofer. It's advertised as having an 11 speaker 100 watt RMS audio system, which when you chuck in the surround speakers and tweeters makes complete sense. It's got Dolby 3 stereo, Dolby Digital Surround, Dolby Pro Logic Surround, Digital Sound Processing, and of course, MyCam Stereo. From your perspective, you're only hearing a sound as good as my camera's microphone and your speakers can muster, but from here, it sounds great. We've got punchy bass, vibrant treble, and that's without the surround sound speakers attached, which sadly, I just don't have. Firing up a CRT like this is a completely different experience to our modern flat screens. Now, I don't just mean the sheer scale of them. This CRT feels like it's got life. It feels like a hulking animal that lies dormant until it's awoken in a burst of glory. It's a bit like when train nerds bang on about steam engines and how they feel like living, breathing creatures compared to modern locomotives. All you need to do is look at the comments on CRT threads and videos to get that vibe. Wow. The old neon glow of a CRT, missed so much. Dude, it's literal perfection. You also look like an ancient electronic wizard with the wand, lol. That CRT sound bleeds through the video and hits me with nostalgia and tinnitus at the same time. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. Nothing beats the comforting glow of an old CRT. And it really doesn't. That strobing light that builds up your CRT image not only gives out a comforting glow, but because the image is literally created by a moving light, which our brain translates to a static picture, the images look incredibly sharp. Moving images look sharper. So when you think back and remember those low resolution images looking great on these boxes, it's not just rose tinted spectacles. Both CRT TVs are the only thing keeping this universe together. Don't let them fall, or a supernova could break through the universe. And really, that's exactly the kind of energy these things give out. Like they're fragments of the past that are holding the universe together. The reality is they're holding our memories together. We spent so much time sat around one of these growing up, whether watching Philip Schofield get slimed on Noel's house party, or hooking up our Commodore 64 and playing for hours on end, but we probably spent more time watching these than talking to our families, and for that reason, they feel like an old friend. So this beast from Toshiba, it's a billion memories all tied up into one. 
one hulking beast. Most people who see this TV swear blind that this is the exact same model they had in their family living room. Oh, that's the exact same telly we used to have, mate. It's probable they had one of the smaller models, maybe the more popular 29-inch, which just seemed bigger at the time. Because these ones are incredibly rare. You know, now we're blessed with huge widescreens, we tend to think that TVs were always huge, but nope, only a very few were back then. You might think the sheer heft of these would make them a natural burglar deterrent, but actually, as the Tamworth Herald reported on the 31st of December 1999, one was stolen from the house of a pensioner using a wheelbarrow. Let's hope they dropped it on their feet. Toshiba would stop making this particular model within a couple of years. They were pushing their own widescreens at the time, and even by January 1999, many outlets had slashed the price of these huge hulkers only for it to drop further and further before the millennium was out. Apparently you can get a 100Hz version, but it wasn't enough to compete with the introduction of digital television, along with widescreens and plasma flat screens. TVs which lacked the soul of the CRT. And for that, this and models like it will always remain in our hearts. Anyway, it's stuck in the corner of Barcadia from now onwards. So if you want to relive that blast of nostalgic radiation, then come and check it out. You might even be able to play Rise of the Robots, if you're lucky. Or not. If you want to stay updated on the welfare of this TV, then please follow the Barcadia Instagram page or the other social medias. And even if you don't care about the welfare of the television, well, follow anyway, because it will help me immensely and I would appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Oh, and I hope to see you at the Doncaster Dome. Anyway, that's this giant TV. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo. Thank you.